Welcome to the Mindset Game Podcast. I am so grateful and excited to have a very special guest with us today, Vanessa Shaw. Vanessa Shaw is an internationally recognized business success coach, helping business owners make a bigger impact, enjoy greater freedom, and create even more abundance in their business and in their life. And she is also the creator of the Business Growth Academy, where she and her team help entrepreneurs turn their dreams into reality. I met Vanessa about eight or nine years ago. And uh, Vanessa, um, you had uh, quite an impact on my career. And I want to thank you once again. And when we met for coffee all those years ago, I was working primarily as a career coach. And I remember wanting to be an executive coach and saying to you, because already then you were an established executive coach, you were uh, very well respected in the community. And I remember, you know, saying to you, you know, I can't do it because, you know, I've never been a senior executive in an organization. I've never led a big team. And you said to me, Varid, that has nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. And you helped me to reframe to see that. Uh, in fact, it could even be a plus because I don't have a specific way of doing things and I could truly coach them into coming up with their own solutions that are highest and best for them and their organization. And for that, I'm deeply grateful because you really opened up many doors for me. Thank you. And I, I still remember that conversation. And then I have to say, I was so grateful for you for reaching back out to me recently and sharing that update. You know, I think as a coach, we sometimes never know, right, exactly the impact. Sometimes it is just, as you say, we had a one-off conversation, a coffee. My intent was, you know, you'd ask for help and I was just pouring into you and I didn't know what happened next. And so it was just, it was really lovely when you reached out to me to give me that update, to share, you know, what had happened as a result of that conversation. And here we are, we, I think we're about eight or nine years past that conversation and then inviting me onto your podcast so yes thank you for sharing and I know that you're up to amazing amazing work in the world as well right and this is all about changing mindsets <laughs> which is what we're going to be talking about today that's right and I know that you are truly a master of that in terms of your own mindset but also helping many many uh, individuals start and grow their businesses and so how about we start with you sharing just a little of your story, a little bit about your background. How did you get into doing all of this? Yeah, and again, especially if I, if I kind of tell it through the lens of mindset and some of the things that we'll likely talk about today. I mean, my background, everybody says, oh, did you, did you have a background in business or corporate or this or that? I was like, no, my background was a stay-at-home mom for 10 years supporting my husband. I mean, prior to that, I actually did work at the United Nations in Switzerland for about six, seven years. And then I gave that up to be a stay at home mom supporting him in a global career. And, you know, not, not just baking cupcakes for my kids, but that's what I say I was particularly good at, right? I love, and I loved it, I loved that role. Um, but I always knew that I wanted to go back to, you know, I would want to do something kind of work-wise. And I'd always had this desire to build my own business, be my own boss. And I think after 10 years of being at home, I was very independent. Um, I certainly didn't need to ask anybody kind of permission or time off or anything. And the thought of going into an organization for me was just like soul, soul crushing back then. I was like, I think I'd just be a, unemployable, frankly, like I would not be a good person. <laughs> Um, in fact, I did at one point when my daughter was younger, uh, I don't tell that many, this to many people, but I actually did do a stint, um, I think for about three months, and I went to work for UNICEF. And I actually really enjoyed the work. I actually really enjoyed the work at the time. It was in product development and UNICEF's a fantastic, um, fantastic organization. But I missed my daughter who was very young at the time. And again, it was that lack of freedom. And so even though they wanted to give me a full-time post that would have represented a promotion, I turned it down and I went back to being a stay-at-home mom whilst I started to figure out what was it I really wanted to do. And I came into coaching through being a life coach. I felt that that was something I was equipped to do. A friend of me, a friend of mine, Manda, one of my besties today, I'm hoping and praying that we're getting together in Europe this summer. Um, she said to me way back then, oh, you know, you were always the one that people came to for advice, at, you know, university, as we would call it in the UK, you should be a life coach. 
Um, I actually didn't know what it was back then. Coaching wasn't very advanced in Switzerland. We were certainly considerably further behind the States. Uh, but I looked into it. And I was like, "Wow! Like, I like I could I could study this, and I could get paid to do this. I mean, this for me was like I have just entered the candy store, right? With all my all that. In my case, it'd be the chocolate, <laughs> the Swiss chocolate store, right? And not actually don't like candy. And it was like, you've got to be kidding. This is just too good to be true. Um, and so I, you know, went down that path of being qualified. I actually started out as a weight loss coach for women in my very early days because I knew kind of how to do that and help women lose weight and improve self-esteem. And that led me to getting an opportunity. It was actually the husband of a client that I was working with overheard me working with his wife and said, hey, could you help me? I've got a lot of stress. I travel a lot. You know, I need to be in peak shape. I've got a lot of responsibility. And like, sure, you know. And we would just chat and walk, actually in forests in Switzerland. And it was a Monday morning. And um, it was always actually one of my favorite sessions of the week. I was later to find out that it was actually the highlight of his week too, and he would just kind of download everything that was happening, but he wanted me to get him moving and hiking and like, let's burn some, it's kind of, it was not burn calories per se, right? It was just like, let's get some of the excess stress off and get focused for the week. And that's really what we were doing. Um, and then he invited me to present to all of his senior partners in a major law firm. So all of a sudden I found myself presenting <laughs> to I think it was about 54 mainly male corporate attorneys in London and created probably what became the very first um, peak performance coaching program inside a law firm. Um, and it was the it was most definitely the first virtual coaching program in, inside a law firm in Europe. Back in the day, everything was, you know, face to face. I They had 10 and there were like 10 European offices that I would cover as well. And I basically said to them, um, it would not make any sense for you to be flying me all around Europe and you are busy and you might need to cancel. And then you've got caught, you know, things happen or blah, 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 you know, whatever. Um, and so I proposed a virtual coaching program that would give them a lot of flexibility. But the truth is, it was also giving me what I wanted to, because remember, I've got young kids. And the last thing I'm thinking, my husband's got a global career as well, is now I have to hire nannies. Now I've got to be schlepping over Europe, all around Europe, coaching. And whilst it sounds glamorous, I, I don't like that kind of travel. I love to travel, but not that way. And so, yes, that became, as I say, this uh, program that developed and de developed me. We, we really grew it for about four years. I had coaches that were working for me. We did internal executive coaching at multiple levels and te talent development in everything. Um, and then, you know, changes within the organization meant that actually I'd been part of the coaching team to actually coach my sponsor to become the head of the law firm. And which was a, you know, an amazing move. And then just kind of internally, there's always some, pol I mean, you know, politics, whatever. But the bottom line was the coaching program, as I knew it, was being disbanded. And it was one of those, you know, we need to bring in this you can kind of you're doing too much here. We need to bring in other people. And I essentially found myself rapidly exiting <laughs> and it's always interesting that, you know, we go into that story and I think this is this is just a great moment to kind of pause um, in terms of mindset. Right. I actually believe that I, I, I know I created that situation um because when I looked back there were I this had been a phenomenal opportunity and I'd learned so much and I trained up as a you know advanced executive level coach in that time I'd reinvested in my skills I was learning so much about business and psychology and everything through that that program and I also knew that my heart was no longer in it and it was one of those moments for Ed where I didn't have the courage to leave. I didn't have the courage to walk away from it because I had golden handcuffs. I had a, you know, fantastic six-figure retainer. 
um, not that many hours that I had to put in. I had opportunity to, you know, kind of bill more, do great work. I would travel with them as well periodically. And yet I knew my heart wasn't in it. And so I, as I say, I didn't have the courage to step away. And I feel like that's something that I created a situation where honestly, the universe closed the door for me, right? And now I was outside and had to rebuild. Um, And it was in part a lot of thanks to, as I say, that contract and, and those years that I was able to look at, well, what was it that I really loved doing? What were the highlights? what would I redo? So many people were saying, well, just kind of bring another program like this into another, you know, into another firm. And again, my heart was absolutely not in that. But when I started to analyze the clients that I really loved working with inside the law firm, it was the rainmakers, right? It was the ones that were making it happen. It was the ones that were setting up new businesses. It was the ones that were constantly bringing in new business or now they're going off to China. Now they're going off to India, And it was very much that sort of they were, you know, um, there's a term, I've used it before, and perhaps some of your listeners are familiar with it, that they're the intrapreneurs, right? They are very entrepreneurial inside an organization, right? Really making it happen. And uh, it was once I started to look at those are the people that I love to work with, that as I went through my rebuilding phase, that led me to wanting to work with more entrepreneurs, Um, And then eventually led me to really niching into, we work with primarily female service-based women-owned businesses um, and a few cool guys. I mean, there's always a few cool guys in my world, but again, it's kind of led me on this path to being a, you know, huge advocate for actually women-owned businesses. And that's where we've landed today. So (laughs) you can see that lots of stepping stones along the way. Oh, and by the way, there was also a major move from Switzerland to Scottsdale, Arizona, uh, because part of that transition was me also getting really honest around the dreams I wanted to pursue, um, what was really in my heart. And I was feeling a big calling to come to the States, which is when you and I met. So, wow, Vanessa, there's so, so much richness in the story that you shared. And I sense that some of the people listening to us today um, are in that place where either a door has been closed and they're finding themselves saying, what, what do I want? Um, and some of them might be in a place where they are, uh, you know, the door hasn't been shut, but their, their heart isn't in what they're doing anymore, whether they are business owners, that they're just wanting to experience something different, maybe more exciting for them, um, or people that are not business owners that are wondering, you know, what if, what, what if there's something else out there for me? And so what would you say to those individuals that are curious, but, but have a lot of fear because it's not mm-hmm. easy to, especially, you know, when we are the, you know, the providers of the family and there's a lot, you know, riding on our ability to, to bring income and, and have that stability mm-hmm. and so on, that safety. What would you say to those individuals that are, you know, curious now? Yeah. I know. And it's, and it's a tough spot, right? Because, um, and I remember, I mean, I distinctly remember some of the, you know, emotions I was going through at the time of confused, frankly, would, you know, I was feeling a lot of confusion. I was feeling a lot of conflict around what I wanted to do. I'd actually just built up my business again at the point where I said, this still isn't it. And I kind of closed everything down to move to the States. So I'd actually, you know, I'd gone from one, this executive coaching to something that morphed into somewhat executive and entrepreneurial coaching. It was a bit of a hybrid back then to building that up to then saying this still isn't it. And now I'm really going gangbusters for what I want. And I would say to anybody listening, and and again, whether inside an organization or running your own organization, right. Or, you know, business is we've got to tune into the desire and start to listen like really listen to what's inside of us. We're not trained, um, we're not trained to pay attention to those signs. Many of us can kind of dismiss that, right? Oh, it's wrong, or who am I? Or we have a story, or it's too late. There's too much at stake. Uh, There's too much to lose. You know, I, I missed the boat on that. Whatever those stories would be, but I know with every 
ounce of my being that desire is the beginning of creation. And those seeds of desire, which are often there in those early days, and I describe them, they're like a seed right inside of us, but just like a seed for an oak tree, that seed for the oak tree has everything within it to become an oak tree and to become something magnificent. When we keep experiencing that sense, you know, that desire within us and those seeds of desire within us, and especially when it doesn't go away, right? We have fleeting desires, of course we do, and there's things and kind of ideas and crazy ideas, but things we wouldn't necessarily want to act upon. Um, but it's those desires that don't go away are often, for me, they're, they're soul-based or they, you know, they're, they're our calling, there's our purpose wanting to, to shine forth. And for me, the first stage of that is really listening and paying attention, um, not necessarily acting on it because we don't always know exactly what it means at first. I certainly didn't. Um, but I would journal a lot. I would read a lot. I would just try and get all those, you know, those like these, this desire is there. Let me kind of like tend to it, right? Let me fan the flames a little bit more, right? And actually really see what's there. And here's often what happens as well. Certainly, you know, most of us, and this is more of a human condition, right? We, most of us don't actually like change. You know, we say that we do. Um, some people really say that they thrive on change, but, you know, it's the fear of change, right, that will stop us. And when we're looking to make any sort of change, we'll often go, our go-to is, what am I going to lose? Like, what do I stand to lose here, right? And that's fear talking to us. Now, we definitely need to listen to that and not ignore it be mindful of, you know, what is fear trying to tell us? Because there are times when fear has got some good wisdom too, right? And it's not, you know, there's some things perhaps you need to pay attention. <laughs> you know, perhaps the voice of fear is actually saying, how are you going to pay the bills? And if you're inside an organization, I've, you know, I've worked with several people inside of organizations that wanted to jump out and build businesses. But, you know, the, fear, the, the voice of fear might have been saying, it's time to get a nest egg in place first, right? We're not just going to go paycheck to paycheck and then think that we're miraculously <laughs> replacing it on the outside. Um, so I think listening right, to fear, but then we've got to flip that over into what do I stand to gain? Most times, most people just stop at the fear piece, right? And that's, but now let's flip it around and say, what is it that I stand to gain? You know, in my particular story, when I told you that, you know, just built the business up again, my kids were actually, um, they were probably around the age of 10 and 15, I think at the time, when my seeds of desire were really burning desire. And this was this calling that I felt to come to the States and really to come to the Southwest. I was really feeling pulled, drawn to this area in the States. And at the time, everybody else was, you know, the voice of fear. Of course, I had concerns. Um, but this is now being echoed in my environment, right? People that were telling me I was crazy. This was not the time to do this for my kids, that um, my marriage would break up because we, I made the decision or we made the decision, decision jointly that I was going to come ahead on my own with the kids to build up a business. And my husband actually stayed behind for nearly two years back in Geneva to finish out his career. Um, so there was a lot of fear, right? There's a lot of fear around, oh my gosh, like, can I, do I really have what it takes now to move across the ocean, right? And go to a place where I knew nobody. I had no friends, no support, nothing, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> I mean, I was giving up, you know, I had, a, I had a nanny back then who was, you know, helping in our family, being in our family for five years. And I had that support as my executive coaching practice had taken off. So there were a lot of real concerns. Um, but ultimately, you know, what I realized it comes down to, Gary, is that that fear is oftentimes it's linked to two things. Fear of disappointment right? That I'll go for it. I'll, I've finally been vulnerable, right? My desire is starting to really shape up into a dream that I want to put a plan around. 
and I want to turn that dream into reality, right? That's what we do in our academy. It's like we turn those dreams into reality. That's a very vulnerable place to be once we've started to, de to declare that, right? And we've got some emotional attachment now to it happening because, right, it, it started to take on a life of its own. And I think one of the biggest fears, people talk about fear of failure and fear of success. I'm like, that's just platitudes. It's just too easy to say that. Uh, I think the fear is the, is the fear of disappointment, right? Of disappointing others and frankly, disappointing ourselves, right? Feeling that disappointment of what if I go for it and I really go for my dream and it doesn't work out. And then very, very closely, very closely linked to that is the fear of judgment, right? So I go for it. I'm being vulnerable, I'm experiencing the disappointment of it not working out. And now I've got the judgment to deal with of other people, right? And probably from ourselves as well, right? And I think it's those two things that keep us locked, right? Keep us locked into not making that move. You just explained that so well. And again, I, I believe that many people out there now are thinking, oh my God, she nailed it. That's, that's, that is it. I couldn't quite pinpoint it until now, but, but that is it. And so what can they do if they're in that place where that, you know, they have the desire, those seeds are there, maybe even some wheels are in motion, but there's some of that inner resistance, some of the, the worries, the concerns, the doubt. What, what can they do? What might be some first steps to, to help them move forward? Absolutely. So I think the first thing is to acknowledge that the fear, doubt and worry are absolutely normal and part of the human condition. And especially whenever we're about to make any change, right? Now we've got that kind of ego or internal saboteur or whatever, what, wanting to keep us safe because change actually feels like a threat, some level, right? It's really threatening. Um, so acknowledging that it's normal is one thing. For me, it can be journaling, starting to get those ideas out of my head as well, like really giving a voice to it. Um, honestly, for me as well, this is a time to, this is why I'm such a huge proponent of coaching, right? Coaching and or mentoring. Because sharing this with somebody else is really important. And sharing it with somebody else that can really help us unpack it, you know, discern between what's real fear, what's valid, and actually start to build a plan, right? And get some, like a course of action around it, <laughs> the dream is really important, right? That's part of actually starting to, you know, let it take some life. Um, it'll also build some accountability as well, right? Most times I say there's many people that regret, you know, there's a, a famous article, which is, I think the, I can't remember what it's called now, but the 10 regrets <laughs> the dying. And I believe it was with, you know, nurses or healthcare workers that are with, right, the patients at those very tender end of moment of life, uh, end of life moments. And, you know, so many of those regrets are around things like I didn't go for it, <laughs> you know, that I'm, I'm dying and my dream is still inside of me. Or, of course, there's always things around, you know, I worked too hard and, you know, didn't spend as much time with loved ones as I would have wanted to or relationships, right, that weren't repaired. So I think, you know, again, that accountability is really important because otherwise we keep those ideas in our head and there's nobody to really say, OK, you've said you want this, right? Now, what are you going to do about it? You know, are we going to keep just talking about it or are we actually going to, you know, take some action? Um, and as I say, for me, that's about really understanding as well the difference between fear and desire. I say this to my clients the whole time, Barry, you know, they're making decisions or taking actions. I'm like, where, where are you taking that from? What, like, is this coming from fear or desire? Right? And fear is going to keep you safe and small. Um, and typically, you're not going to make leaps forward there. Or are you really leaning into your desire for what you want and taking actions and making decisions from there? And there comes a point where if we tend to those desires enough, the desire becomes stronger than our fears, right? And that's where we need to tip the balance. If, 
we've got to think of it like, you know, it's like two, um, kind of got the idea of like, I don't know, like wrestlers or people boxing in a boxing ring, you know, between like, you know, fear and desire. But it's like the strongest one is going to win. And fear can pack some meaty punches, right? It really can. Um, so again, there, the minute we start to really tend to those desires, know as well, my truth, you know, the truth as well, really the universal truth around this is desire has been given to you for a reason. And you wouldn't be given your form of desire if you didn't have the ability to fulfill on it as well. So that's why I really listened to that because I'm like, that would be like giving me hunger and I can't eat or it's like giving me thirst and I can't drink, right? So again, I lean into that. No, this is there for a reason. And for me, it's like a muscle. The more we listen to it, trust it, take action on it, start to get new results because we're going down that path, right? Results are going to be the, you know, in the early days, they might be small results, but I see those as the breadcrumbs of evidence, right? That we're following that path and it's really leading us in the way that we want to. We start to get some results. But the bigger those results are, the more it reinforces that circle of desire or cycle of desire. And then it's like a muscle. We start to trust it. You know, and when fear comes up again, like, oh, okay, I know this, right? I must be changing again. I must be expanding again, right? Okay, let me give fear a voice for a while and let me also give my, you know, desire a voice as well. And again, let's let's see which one I'm going to actually listen to. I, I think what you're sharing is very wise and very real. And I, too, as like you, I'm a coach and I and I see that um, in terms of clients, uh, once they give that fear voice, you know, the acceptance of what is rather than kind of just repressing it or, you know, it's not a comfortable thing to focus on, you know, so some of us just tend to just focus on the desire and and yet that part of us needs to be heard and seen and felt, um, you know, before we can really get what is the learning that it, it wants for us to get from that, because there is wisdom um, in that. But once we get that, we can let it go mm. and, and focus on the desire. And like you said, really give more energy, more momentum to that side of the equation, um, because I, I do believe it sounds similar to you that we are being guided. And, and I know that also from the work, you and I talked a little bit about heart math before we started to record. And we know that we have access to that intuition, our heart's intelligence that is supporting us on, uh, you know, tuning into those little breadcrumbs, you know, to be able to follow the path until it gains more and more and more momentum. And so, what about for those individuals that are already successful business owners, their business is uh, thriving, um, but yet there's a little part of them that's, you know, curious or, you know, that new little desire, a new little seed is being born, but they're, they feel so attached to their business or they don't want to mm -hmm. let their team down if they were to sell it or, or something like that. So what, what do you recommend for those individuals? Oh gosh, these are, these are really great questions. Because I think, you know, when things aren't going the way you want them to, it's easier to make a change, right? Inevitably, even though still, like in my example, I was still attached to something, right? And the comforts and everything that I had around that initial contract. But when things are actually going well, or certainly look as if they're going well on the outside, yes, it gets tricky, right, to make those changes. Um, but again, it comes back to there's actually two parts to this. One, typically what I find is happening in that process, um, I actually wrote a book on this, by the way, it's called The Million Dollar Question. Oh. And yeah, just in case your listeners, I mean, they can actually go to themilliondollarquestion.com and actually download the whole book. It's a short one, but I'm going to give you a kind of a snippet of what that's about, because it's a really important question to answer first. Thank you. And um, the million dollar question happened, and I'll, I'll give an example of kind of how this was showing up in a, a, um, a client's medical practice and talk about it in the book. But again, her medical practice, she's one of the top doctors here in Phoenix. I mean, she's every single year, you know, wins all the awards, multi-million dollar practice, phenomenal, um, she's actually a functional practice, functional medicine, real leader in that field. 
phenomenal um, space, you know, that she treats patients in and everything and, and her team does. And uh, she was attending an event that we were, uh, you know, uh, hosting and we were talking about this making changes. And I was asking about, you know, we've got to look at it before making the changes. What are you currently tolerating? Right. What are you actually tolerating? This is about the million dollar question, because what tends to happen is we want to make some changes, but we're actually tolerating a whole load of things in our life. That, And I say tolerating because we actually don't even know, notice, but we become burdened by things. Right. Um, our heart is typically not in certain things anymore. Right. We're not feeling so joyful and we're actually not going to get what we want. We'll actually get what we tolerate. So for me, that process becomes around like, let's ask that million dollar question first and actually get out on the table, like all of the things, right? Life, business, whatever it is that are not working. And I've realized I'm tolerating them. So in her particular case, she realized that she was tolerating not making a decision. So she'd had this idea the desire was there. It was in her head. Um, she'd gone as far as making plans and all the rest of it. But the decision is when we really commit, right? Decision is we're cutting off all other you know, possibilities. I've made the decision. I'm going to commit. And now I'm going to move forwards. And she said, I'm tolerating, Vanessa, not making the decision on something that I really want to do. And in her case, it was about moving from an insurance-based practice into fully concierge, which in the medical world, again, is a really big change, right? And this means, um, you know, patients will be, feel let down, they might feel abandoned, they may feel disappointed. There can be criticism from peers as well, um, because, you know, there can be a lot of kind of, <laughs> let's say it's projection, but that's really what it is, right? <laughs> From other people that feel uncomfortable with the changes. And inevitably, this could have me meant laying off team, changing team. I mean, there were, there were just ripples and ripples to it. But she said, because one of the things I'll take people through is like, I want you to actually look at the cost of your tolerations. And in business, it's not just financial, right? That of course, we were looking at this through the financial lens, but it's like, the emotional cost. She was really stressed. I mean, the whole time she's like, this is, you know, and doctors, by the way, are one of the most stressed um, professions as are attorneys, interestingly enough. <laughs> and um, she just was, you know, you know, in a very demanding role within the practice, experiencing a lot of stress. But a lot of her stress also came from knowing that she wasn't giving the kind of healthcare and service and treatments that she really knew she could if she were concierge. And the whole system of being in an insurance space, it just precludes being able to do so much deeper, right, extensive work and really creating the, what she calls the um, kind of healthcare breakthroughs, right, mm -hmm. that she knows are possible, like really reversing many, many, many conditions that most people think are a life sentence. And so, you know, we were looking at the emotional cost. We're looking at the spiritual cost. It comes back to, we're like, what if? You know, what if you take this to the, the grave with you? Um, what if you don't stand up? What if you are not pioneering in concierge functional practice? Um, and then we looked at the financial cost of this. And for her, that's, been, that's why it's called the million dollar question. She was like, well, I've just done the math on this. And there's at least a million dollars of opportunity as well financially. So once she actually looked at the numbers, it was kind of, a, it was looking at all of those factors, right? The emotional cost, the spiritual cost to it, the leadership, the financial, that tipped the balance, right? Out of fear into desire. And we spent the next year working together to actually transition and go through that whole transition. But again, right, that's an example of, you know, somebody that on the outside, it looks successful. She would have been like people are in her field are looking up to her for guidance, right? And so, yes, it all looked great. But when we unpacked, you know, million dollar question, 
what are all those things that you're tolerating? You, you can see that she can't keep tolerating those things and get what she wants, right? So we had to work on both sides. And most times, somebody's not going to present really, really happy, <laughs> like really joyful and fulfilled and want to completely change things, right? That's not, that is, it's, inc we might want to expand things and do more of what's working, right? And have more of it and more abundance. But, you know, I've never made changes in my own business. We, we shut down a, a program just before COVID. Um, and it was the same thing that I realized I was tolerating it and I was tolerating it being draining. I was tolerating not getting results in the way that I knew we could get results for our clients in a much quicker, bigger way. And to your point there around making those changes, you know, we have to, we have to let go to grow. And that letting go is, a, that's scary, right? Because we, we let go of something, however it's been working. It may still have been paying the bills or generating revenue, right? Or whatever it is, but we've got to let go of something. And that, that thing needs to die before the next thing can be born mm -hmm. and creation can happen. And it's in the space between those two that, Right, we've got to really have that inner resilience and the belief in ourselves and we keep tapping into the desire and what we want to create for the future so that we can actually bridge the gap. Yeah. Well, Vanessa, you have given so many gifts to me personally today and without a doubt to our listeners um, who have that dream inside of them that they wish to turn into reality. And they may be tolerating something, they may be experiencing pain, but, but there is that, that spark inside that, that needs to be seen and heard and felt and, uh, and that there is support out there to help them with the transition. So would you be willing to share how they can learn more about you, your programs, your books, all of the wonderful services that you have to offer to support people in those positions? Yeah, and as I said, you know, the million dollar question.com is a great place to start. And by the way, you can also download that at my website as well, which is businessgrowthacademy.com. Um, that's just a really great read. I re obviously recommend that to everybody as a starting place. And and always we just we're open to conversations. You know, we're not in the business of selling things that don't work or selling things to you know people at the wrong stage. So again, if somebody's feeling like, oh my gosh, like this is resonating. Again, they can reach out through the website, schedule a time on our calendar. We will talk with you in, in exactly the same way that I did with you, right? Back then, whatever it was, eight, nine years ago, um, and see if there's a fit or not. And I do have, I have a Facebook group that's called the Million Dollar Group. Obviously, there's a bit of a million dollar theme going on here because <laughs> most of our clients are wanting to be on that path to growing million dollar businesses. Um, but that's also another place that we can connect online. And of course, LinkedIn, Instagram as well. Beautiful. Well, thank you. Thank you, Vanessa, from my heart uh, for your time, for your wisdom, for your stories today. I know you know that this is much bigger than you and I. Somebody's meant to hear mm. what you share today. And, and that might just make all the difference for them to not go to the grave with the dream still inside of them. So thank you so much. Thank you.